The book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, and verse 15 and 16 read, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, and that as many as would not worship the beast, the image of the beast, should be killed. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The title of the message is, Will There Be a Sunday Law? Let us pray. Father in heaven, bless your word, anoint it with your presence, and give us the mind and open heart to hear and to study these things with intensity that we might fulfill the promise that the wise will understand. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible declares in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter and verse eight, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Many have read this and believe with good reason that the issues of the last day evolve around the adherents and inhabitants of this earth worshiping on a certain day and that the world government will enforce a day of worship in which those who choose not to worship on that day will in fact be economically boycotted. They will not receive the mark of the beast and hence they will not be able to buy or sell. The intent of this study is to simply examine the evidence. Before we launch into our study, I want to do a quick review of where we have come in this series. We're now in, in the presentation number six, and in the five previous presentations, it's led us to this presentation, and I want to do a summary before we launch into our study. Notice carefully, in our first presentation, we talked about the fact that throughout all of scripture, the challenge that God had over and over again is that he had a people who were not faithful in following him and having a relationship with him, but instead continuously time and time again would follow after the gods of other nations and begin to worship other gods. We see that from Genesis to Revelation. And then we said that Israel didn't trample upon the Sabbath and then commit idolatry, but they polluted the Sabbath because of idolatry. In other words, because they had completely rebelled against God, it was then only a natural consequence that they also forsook the Sabbath. And then we talked about the fact that while Rome has changed indeed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week and was responsible for changing it to the first day of the week, it did not, however, officially 
change the commandment to the fourth uh, to the first day of the week as it did by changing the actual second commandment, removing it from the Decalogue and dividing the last commandment into two to literally change the law. And then we went on to say that Babylon is not Rome, neither is it apostate Judaism, but it is both combined. It's not either or, but it's both and. And we said Babylon or Judaism received its deadly wound when Christ brought the sanctuary system to a immediate halt when he died on the cross. Judaism had used the sanctuary as its national, national pride, but the leaders were practicing such steep corruption through that system, charging even the adherents of those who would come to Jerusalem to worship God in the three high days through the year, they would charge them absorbent prices, not to mention the fact that they were practicing all kinds of abominations through that system. And as a result, God, Jesus himself, would bring that system to a crashing halt. And as a result, it would bruise the head. It would crush the head of the serpent. And that system would come to its close by receiving a deadly wound. And then we said, in order for that deadly wound to heal, Judaism would have to resume a place of prominence by rebuilding another temple so that that which caused their ruin would then be their awakening and be their re, re, it would then be their means of healing the deadly wound. The rebuilding of the temple will cause the whole world to wander after the beast. Judaism, along with papacy, will lead the world into the acceptance of an antichrist religion. The religion will be opposed to all that bear the name of Christ. And if you haven't seen our five previous uh, presentations, I'd like you to I'd like to suggest that you should do that so that you can have all the evidence for yourself. Okay, so here's the question. Why does Revelation 14 and verse 7 say, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And many say, well, if you read the verse carefully, you will find that the elements mentioned that point to the worship of him who is sitting on the throne in heaven points to the fact that they are to worship him who created the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. And immediately the thought comes, ah, that sounds like Exodus, the 20th chapter, and verse 11, which reads, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so there we have it. We can see the parallel. Then in Revelation 14, 7, it points out that we are to worship the one who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And then Exodus tells us to do the same thing. Thing. Before we go on any further, I want to say this. Does God command us to worship him on the day that he has set aside the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath? Absolutely. I wanted to make that clear. Let me say that again. Does God command us to worship him, those who love him? Because the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the fourth commandment is the commandment that commands us to keep and to worship and to honor God on his holy Sabbath day. And yes, the Bible commands us to do so. I want to say that up front. But does that mean that the issue surrounding the mark of the beast will lead to 
whether we observe a day, a certain day or not. Will it evolve around the worship of Sunday? And that's the question we need to ask. And while it seems plausible that that is certainly a great possibility, we have to ask ourselves, based on the evidence from the Word of God, can we justify that? And so I want us to take a look at something. You see, what I believe and what the Bible, I believe, tells us is that God is a peculiar God. And while God expects and desires for us to worship him and observe his seventh day Sabbath, it's much larger than that because God want, doesn't want us to keep just one commandment. He wants us to keep all the commandments. And in fact, in Revelation, the 12th chapter in verse 17, it gives the idea that Satan is angry with a certain group of people. And what people are they that Satan is angry with? The Bible says the remnant. And who are they? Notice verse 17, and the dragon, that is Satan, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice carefully, the word is plural, not a commandment, but commandments. And we know that to be true because there are many people who keep the Sabbath, but who do not have a relationship with God. One being, of course, during the time of Christ, the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they kept the Sabbath, but they were also responsible for taking the life of the Messiah. So it can't just be only about a day. In fact, in our previous presentations, we've talked about the fact that there are undercurrent movements in this world amongst many Jewish leaders, Sanhedrin in particular, that have sown a seed, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world, advocating the need for this new world order to be run by the Noahide laws. And again, if you've not seen the previous presentations, I'd like to strongly encourage you to do so. But these Noahide laws are what are planned to operate and function this world in the new world order. It's their plot. It's their plan to use these seven laws that are man-made from the Babylonian Jewish Talmud that are intended to be used to govern this world. And isn't it interesting that in the time of Christ, Jesus contended against the Judaizers who also had adulterated the law and had put so many and added so many different laws to that which was not given to them and Jesus, in seeing that they had actually altered his law, spoke to them in Matthew, the 15th chapter, in verse 9, and said, In vain you do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In the last days, we will see this as a repeat, that Judaizers will put forth their law, yet once again, to try and lead and mislead this world to following a false religion. Wow, the Bible has told us so. But not only that, as I've stated, this all, the end time events, is pointing us to the creator and thus true worship. So when Revelation 14, 7 talks about him that created the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of the water, Yes, it's talking about and can be applied to the Sabbath, but in a more broad and general sense, it's actually pointing to the God who created the heavens and the earth. And that what literally John was saying to us through the pen of inspiration is that we ought to serve and identify who we serve, not by those gods that are supposedly from the from the monotheistic religions that believe that, 
you know, uh, heavens were created by one God, water was created by another God, and, and trees were created by another God, cows were created by another God. No, there is one God who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, and everything that exists. And the Bible is pointing us to the worship of that God and not simply to a day. In fact, notice Jeremiah 10 and verse 11, thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Did you notice what God said? He said that the gods who have been worshiped, that people believe have created things. He says those gods, and it, by inference, what he's saying is those who worship those gods, they will perish from the earth. Wow. Not only that, but in Jeremiah 51 and verse 44, the Bible says this, and I will punish Bel in Babylon and will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up and the nation shall not flow together anymore unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Hmm, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Notice verse 47, therefore behold the days come, I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon and her whole land shall be confounded and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. Notice God says that the day and time is coming where there will be a controversy wherein God will win that controversy and show to all the inhabitants of the world that he is the true and living God. And how will he do that? He will show, he will reveal through the power of judgment, he will crumble the other religions. Why or how? He will do so by bringing judgment upon those who choose not to have a relationship with him. Hence, the Bible is revealing yet once again that it's all about worship. Will you worship the true and living God or will you choose a false system of religion and choosing thereby a false God? And of course, in the last days, the Antichrist will come. Satan himself will, will, will appear as if he is God himself and many will fall for it. But those who are truly wise, the Bible says that even if possible, the very elect would be deceived. So it's going to be a it's going to be a delusion of such magnitude. This being is going to be so majestic and so royal and regal that many will believe truly indeed that this is the Christ. But the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes, he will not touch the earth. The Bible says every eye shall see him and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Hence, we know and understand that the true and living God will not touch this earth. And hence, the wise will understand. Well, you know, there's some who say, well, Pastor Art, what about Ezekiel, the eighth chapter? Because there it talks about sun worship. It talks about, essentially, it's talking about you know, Sunday observance, a Sunday law. Well, let's take a look. Ezekiel 8 and verse 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. Now, I want you to take notice of something. In this chapter, Ezekiel the prophet is taken up in vision and six times the word abomination is mentioned as God takes him from this place and this location here in the sanctuary to another location and he continues to tell him over and over again, look further and you'll see these abominations, but there are even more, greater abominations here and greater and more and more and more. Several times we see that the prophet is pointed toward a numerous large number of abominations that transpire. 
and to pick only one of them is not, I think, a good hermeneutical strategy of interpreting scripture. In fact, there was not just one abomination, as I've said, there were many, for God was indicting them for a complete apostasy, not just one sin. You see, the mention of them worshiping the sun was not a reference to a day. The reason we know that is because in the context, it had been a regular practice that the children of Israel would go astray and they would worship like the other heathen nations around them when they would fall into idolatry. And what was one of the practices? They would often practice, the other heathen nations would, would give homage and worship to the, to the heavens and to the bodies of the heavens. And so here we just see worship yet once again entering into the picture. And we know that, of course, that Sunday itself, the worship of the day, Sunday, didn't actually appear on the scene until about the fourth or fifth century in the Council of Laodicea with Constantine, where the law was eventually changed over, you know, hundreds of years. And voila, today, Sunday worship is, is a norm. But back then, Sunday was not the day. And I know some of you saying, well, no, it's just symbolic. Well, Actually, it can't be just symbolic because they were really actually worshiping the sun. Again, this is a symbol for false worship in opposed to true worship. Well, then there's some who say, well, wait a minute. What about Daniel 7 verse 25? Daniel 7 verse 25 says, and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a dividing of times. Now here we see that this entity, this little horn power, arrives on the scene, and the Bible says, identifying who he is, he would seek to change times and laws. And so we naturally, with good reason, we would say, wait, that just simply of certainly points to Sunday worship, well, I will agree that it does point to what this power will do. But what it does not do is tell us how he will do it. For example, we know that the papacy is largely responsible for having already changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week but in this verse, do we find nowhere where it says how that will take place? In other words, it does not suggest that the change will occur at the time when the mark of the beast goes forward. It's already been changed. So it's not as though the mark of the beast is somehow a new addition to the papacy's agenda. No. So in other words, it tells us that we that he will change times, meaning the day of worship, which he has already done, but it does not tell us how, in other words, bring about the mark of the beast. Nowhere in the previous scriptures or thereafter does it specifically mention that he will change this day, this law, when the mark of the beast comes forward. Now, you know, another question we, we have to ask ourselves, and I think, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not being facetious by saying this, but, you know, if there comes a time when the Antichrist comes forward and he announces to the whole world, I have now just changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and you must all obey. Many, many of people are going to scratch their heads and say, huh? And the reason I say that is because all around the world, most of Christianity, and especially those who are part of the Roman Catholic tradition, they worship on Sunday anyway. So then to say you're going to change it from Saturday to Sunday, most people will say, well, I thought Sabbath was Sunday. And of course, there are some people 
a few, a handful of people who do know the real day of worship. Most people are still under the ideology that the day has changed since Christ went to the cross. And I'm not just sure that people, after years of indoctrination, are suddenly going to come to a place where they reject that whole idea. You know, it takes a long time for some people to let go of ideas and conviction doesn't come overnight. So I'm, I'm just merely saying that for us to consider. And then there are those who say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Art, what about the Pope? What about the Sunday laws? There are many mentions and we hear reverberations all over the world and even climate change is touting the idea of the Sunday law. And listen, I understand I do because I myself, before looking into this, have felt the same way. But I just want to say this, Sunday laws can and often are put into place in order to regulate a higher sense of morality and to promote spiritual accountability. In other words, if they want to stop commerce, all they have to do is pass a law that prohibits businesses from being in operation. So the governments that be, and we see this happening now in Europe and in other nations throughout the world, they're just simply wanting people to become more spiritual, not necessarily saying that they're trying to enforce and impose a day of worship, but simply to help people be more spiritually conscious, spend more time with their family. And in fact, the Pope himself has promoted this idea of observing a particular day of the week, and of course he means Sunday, as a day to spend with your family, to spend social time, to rest from the hustle and bustle. And oh, by the way, in doing so, because you're not out and about consuming, you know, so much, uh, using so much uh, CO2, that you can also preserve the planet as a result. But the end time worship evolves around the worship of a person or a religion and not so much a day. And what do I mean by that? Well, in particular, for example, Revelation 13 and verse 4, and they worship the dragon, that's obviously a person or Satan himself, and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So here, really in a very direct way, the book of Revelation talks to us about the fact that the end time issue evolves around worshiping a person or the religion put forth by that person. And in fact, what we have said on a continuous basis is that very often we can see, in fact, in most religions, monotheistic religions, there's a teaching that there is a Messiah complex or a Messiah individual of sorts in almost every major religion. In Zoroasterism, there is Soshiant. In Judaism, of course, they're looking for the Messiah. In Buddhism, they're looking for the Maitreya. In Hinduism, they're looking for Kalki. In Taoism, they're looking for Li Hong. In Babism, he whom God shall make manifest. In Islam, within the Sunni tradition, they're looking for the Mahdi. And in Islam, the Shiite tradition, they're looking for Isa. And of of course, uh, the Mahdi or Isa is none other than Christ himself. So you see, the worship, the, the, the issue around the end time has to do with worshiping or uh, giving adherence to a person or a religion. Well, what about these statements from the Datsusi? Many of us have seen these statements and I was convicted by them myself. For example, on page 286, it says public authorities have the duty to ensure that for reasons of economic productivity, citizens are not denied time for rest and divine worship. Christians, in respect of religious freedom and of the common good of all, should seek to have Sundays recognized as legal holidays. 
They have to give everyone a public example of prayer, respect and joy, and defend the traditions as a precious contribution to the spiritual life of society. Notice what the Pope says. He says, in essence, that Sunday should be a day put forth for what reason? To pay a part of the significance of a spiritual, comp uh, spiritual contribution to society as a whole. In other words, just as there are other religions that have their spiritual contribution to society as a whole, so also should Christianity employ its use, or I should say its observance, as a means of also contributing to the world peace, the world unity, and the one world religion. And then there's this other statement, page 237 of Laudato Si, that says, on Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, hmm, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. The law of weekly rest forbades work on the seventh day. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest, that is Sunday, centered on the Eucharist, sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. So notice this. Again, he makes it in comparison to the Jewish religion, which observes its sacred day on Sabbath. Now, here's what's interesting. As I've stated over and over again in our previous presentations, that Babylon is not simply Rome in and of itself. But Babylon consists of both Rome and apostate Judaism. And the two will combine together. Listen, we know that there have been plans for many years, and as I've stated in the last presentation, I believe there will be a third temple, and for good reason, the Bible lists several passages of Scripture that talk about the temple. Who opposeth and exalteth his health above all that is called God, because he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God? Well, here, this Antichrist figure, this abomination of desolation, shows up in a temple. And yes, I believe it's a literal temple. And Jesus, just as in his day, talked about the abomination of desolation when the armies of Rome would actually enter the city of Jerusalem, go into the sanctuary and destroy it, burn it to the ground along with the city. So likewise, in these last days and time, there will be a temple erected. So we're going to see an alliance of sort between the man of sin, the papacy, and the Judaizers, apostate Judaism, come together and be able to have their days of worship. Because if you recall in our previous presentation, we said that this temple is being built for the purpose of all religions being able to come and to worship there, and they base it on Isaiah 56, which says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Now, I don't know exactly how they're planning to do it, but I think that one of the ways they could perhaps put forth a plan, an idea to implement it, is that perhaps on Fridays, which is the Muslim sacred day of observance, they will be able to use the temple. And then on Saturday, of course, the Jews, they can put forth their time to spend the whole day in sacred prayer there at the temple. And then those who follow the beast, the papacy himself, they may choose to worship on Sunday. But I don't know exactly how this is going to play out. They may even section off this, the, the temple where everyone can use it and use a different portion and have different parts. And maybe they'll create an outer court that can facilitate everyone being able to pray at certain times or whatever. I don't know. But I simply believe that in the end of time, 
There's going to be a one world religion and not a monotheistic religion, a religion where everyone accepts each other's religion, but the only religion that will not be fully embraced or accepted is that of Christianity. And I know you're saying, well, wait a minute, the Pope, he's a Christian. And we talk about that in our last presentation where we say, yes, he is. But when you look at how the leaders within the, the Church of Rome keep the, the, the establishment, or I should say, keep the, the religion, it's a far cry from what the people believe. And I believe that when the time comes, it will simply be a statement of saying, you know what? God is God. Worship him. Jesus is not. And that is the new Catholic religion. I know some of you may feel like, oh, that's far-fetched. But again, I want to remind you that it was the Christians during the Dark Ages by the millions that were persecuted. Those who followed Christ. And Rome never changes. So now notice this. I, I want us to see something. Because looking very honestly at this, and I'm just trying to be very honest with what the Word of God says. When we look at the number of verses that literally spell out the idea that the mark of the beast is either worship, all about worship, who you worship, and, 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 uh, and whether it's God, the true or living God, or if it evolves around a day. When you look at, there are really basically three verses. And the verses that I've chosen that represent a day, in other words, the mark of the beast evolving around a certain day or a Sunday law, there are really only three verses that we can go to that literally spell out what, you know, and, and those verses, as we look at them, uh, they, they, they kind of have a semblance to Sunday worship. They don't explicitly say, you know, this is going to be about the fourth commandment. Listen, I, I, I'm not trying to be facetious, but think about this for just a moment. With this being the last culminating event of Earth's history, where the mark of the beast will choose the destiny of people forever, unlike any other generation, wouldn't it be plausible to think that perhaps if this was specifically about a day, that it would be mentioned so clearly, so unequivocally all throughout the book of Revelation, all throughout the book of Daniel, that it would be without question so that we could know with assurance. And I'm, I just don't see that. But what I do see in the area of worship, look at the number of scriptures that actually point to the idea. And there were many others, actually, but these were the most pointed ones that point to, to, to the idea that the end time events will point to who we worship. You know, let's just take a quick purview. I want to show you throughout scripture those particular instances that we see that most closely represent or resemble what will happen in the end times. For example, you remember in the book of Esther, the book of Esther paints this picture of the people of God who come under duress as a result of Mordecai doing something and Haman gets upset. And as a result, he conspires with the king and puts out a decree that all of God's people will suddenly be exterminated at a certain time. And what is it that triggered that whole event? Was it because the people of God worshiped a certain day? No. In fact, when you look at Esther, the third chapter in verse two, you find the triggering event. And what was it? One day, Mordecai was standing there at the gate of the city and Haman comes walking in. There are others who are standing there. Those who seen Haman suddenly in awe and reverence fell to their faces and bowed and reverenced him. But Mordecai, knowing the second commandment, 
He dare not bow down to a man and give him homage as though he were God. When Haman seen that, he became infuriated and it set in order a direction and a course of action that he began to take so that finally and at last it was the people of Mordecai that were targeted as a result of his obstinance to not bow down and worship. The whole ordeal is about worship. It's about worship. Or what about the book of Daniel in Daniel the third chapter, which again gives a kind of reflection that in the last days, you know, there will be those who will be persecuted. And, and while it even seems to hint to an idea of the time of worship, because the king said, at such time as you hear the sackbut, the flute, the dulcimer, the harp, and you fall down and worship me at such and such a time, he put out the decree that that should happen, lest if you don't, you will face the burning fiery furnace. But of course, the Hebrew worthies, knowing and understanding, yet again the second commandment, refuse to bow to an image. Now there are some who use this story and say, see, see, this is about the time of worship. When? When the music plays. But wait a minute. The bigger issue of the story regulates around the bowing down and giving homage essentially to Nebuchadnezzar, who made the image, but specifically that they were to bow down to this image, commit idolatry, and worship the God of Nebuchadnezzar. So here again, we see that the, the, the literal outcome of the story and the moral lesson that we can draw from it has to do more so with worship because there certainly wasn't a mention of any particular day that he was called, that he called the adherents or the the inhabitants of the kingdom to bow to this particular idol. No, it's all about worship. And then, of course, what about Daniel 5? Because we see a direct reference in Daniel 5 to Revelation, the ninth chapter. What happens in Daniel 5? You remember King Belteshazzar, and we mentioned this in our previous uh, presentation as well, King Belteshazzar is having a party, just enjoying himself, drinking and having a debauchery, and just, just the festivities of the night were just crazy until finally he decides, I'm going to take the vessels that came from Jerusalem, I'm going to fill them in wine, and then I'm going to lift my glass and serve and worship the gods that he knew of. Again, it's about worship, not about a day but simply that he used something that was sacred, something that was set apart, something that God had intended to be used for a sacred purpose, and he used it to serve and to worship other gods. And we said in our presentation that this is symbolic of us. We are vessels. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. And so hence, these vessels are a symbol of us and that we are not to serve gods of idols of stone, uh, idols of stone and of, of gold and silver and bronze and wood. In fact, the book of Revelation, the ninth chapter in verse 20 says, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hand, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Wow. In explicit terms, the book of Revelation talks about those who will, be, who will come under the wrath of God with the plagues, and in particular, it names why they will come under judgment. Because they chose to worship gods of stone, of wood, of silver, and gold, and bronze, and so forth and so on. Again, the Bible and throughout Scripture in the book of Revelation, as we talked about, for example, in chapter 17, Babylon is the abomination, is the mother of abominations. And we looked high and low throughout Scripture and found on several occasions that the abominations that are spoken of is idolatry, idolatry. So we can see that over and over again, consistently, it has to do with worship.
worship in opposed to a day. Now, notice something. I want to shift gears a little bit here and take notice of something. Did you know that the world leaders behind the scene in the New World Order, guess what ethnic background they are comprised of? For example, the Illuminati consists of 20 men in this world who hold the wealth in their hand. Jacob Rothschild, Nathaniel Rothschild, John Rothschild, Evelyn Rothschild, David Rockefeller, Nathan Warburg, Henry Kissinger, George Soros, Paul Volcker, Larry Summers, Lloyd Blankenfin, Ben Shalom. These individuals are all of Jewish heritage. Now think about that for just a moment. These are the men who own the world banks. The finances of the world rest in the hands of who? Jewish individuals. This is taken from John Whitley, Seven Jewish American Control, Most U most U.S. media. And he wrote this, it is not hyperbole that the Jews control the major media outlets. Seven Jewish Americans run the vast majority of U.S. television networks, the printing press, the Hollywood movie industry, the book publishing industry, and the recording industry. Did you hear that? The major components of industry represented in the United States are owned and controlled by Jewish individuals. Again, printing press, Hollywood, book publishing industry, the record label industry. And not only that, but notice this, he goes on to say that several directors in Seagram's uh, you know, Seagram's alcohol and uh, General Electric's, the News Corporation Limited, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, CNN, MTV, Universal Studios, MCA Records, Jeffen Records, DC, GC Records, and so forth and so on, all owned by Jews. Now, here we see that most of the wealth in the world is controlled by the Jewish, by Jewish people. Not only that, but did you know that there were also have been Jewish popes? In fact, notice this. This is, uh, this is taken from um, Ratzlaff, but the pope was Jewish, says historian, the truth seeker, quoting Metro News. February 12th, it says this, crypto Jews have over the years gained such control over the Roman Catholic Church that several have risen to the high office of the papacy. Yaakov Wise, a researcher in Orthodox Jewish history and philosophy concluded that Pope John Paul II was Jewish. So not only do we see the Jewish the Jewish people who control the record industry, the news, media outlets, MTV, and so many other vast number of industries, but they also have a high degree of presence among the papacy and within the Roman Catholic Church. Now here's something you might find really interesting. Pope Francis himself has a huge a background, or I should say a, a, a quite a cozy uh, history with the Jewish nation. Notice carefully, Claudia Impelman, director of the Latin American Jewish Congress, said that I think it is the first time a pope has been elected that the Jewish commun community knows previously and has a long history with and that he is very, very optimistic about the future of relations between Jews and Catholics. If you had to choose a pope by Jewish interest, you would have had to choose Berglio, that is Pope Francis, 
Eppelman said, Julia Schlosser, the president of a Buenos Aires synagogue and the other Argentine delegate in Greece said that Francis is my friend and a friend of the rabbis who is very close to the Jewish community. Why doesn't that surprise me? I believe, and as we stated in our previous presentation, in 2017, there was a bilateral commission where Vatican met with the high leaders there in Jerusalem to conspire about future plans and how they can work together. Does that point to the fact that, again, the Bible is true when it says that the that the, the beast power is comprised of both church and state, the papacy, as well as apostate Judaism? Absolutely. In fact, notice this, Freemasonry is a Jewish establishment whose history grades official appointments, passwords, and explanations are Jewish from beginning to end. Wow. Notice carefully, even the Masonic order comes from a Jewish background. It was constructed by Judaism, no doubt following the, the, the Babylonian Talmud. In fact, notice this. It is from these Kabbalistic and Talmudic recondite doctrines of Judaism that the Freemasons and other occult workers of iniquity derive their beliefs. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because do you know that every major leader in this world is a Freemason, or I should see, say at least 80 to 90% of them are Freemasons. In fact, you can hardly rise to a high level of, of wealth and notoriety without being involved in some form of secret society. And guess what? We've just been shared. It's been, just been made known through this this article that Freemasonry has its roots in apostate Judaism. Now, I want you to show you something because here's another question we have to ask ourselves. That the Sanhedrin that was put forth, and we talked about this in our last video, is that in 2004, the Sanhedrin, the nascent Sanhedrin was reconstructed and have had tremendous power and authority wielding its power throughout the different leaders in the, the New World. And in particular, we read in our last presentation how they asked and solicited that President Trump would go about his mission in life that God has called him to, and that is to build the Third Temple and to implement the Noahide Laws. By the way, we, as you recall, in our second presentation, we talked about the fact that, that the last six presidents have signed the Noahide Laws to include Donald Trump himself. So why am I saying this? Because the nascent Sanhedrin that are compri comprised of the sage Jewish leadership are staunch Sabbath keepers, okay? It is highly unlikely that they would give up the observance of the Sabbath day if a Sunday law is imposed. And oh, by the way, if they're going to be in collaboration with the beast power, that is Rome, and the, uh, apostate Judaism come together because they formed together Babylon, then why would they give up when they hold, when they hold the power? Not only that, but we see evangelicals in high support of Israel. And all of Israel, again, keeps the Sabbath. Notice this, Lori Cardoza Moore uh, shared this Jerusalem Post under the headline, Evangelical Leader Compares Netanyahu and Trump to Biblical Figures. And she goes on to say in this article how she believes that God called Netanyahu and Trump to both conspire together to bring about the end time events that God wants to culminate being the third temple and Israelites returning to their land. She goes on to say, of course, that she belongs to a nonprofit organization 
called Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, or P T uh, P J uh, T N, which works to educate Christians about their biblical responsibility to stand with their Jewish brethren and Israel. She provides a link. She is a, a conduit, if you will, between the evangelical Christians and Israel. Evangelicals have a high stake in Israel because they believe that in order for United States to be blessed, you've got to treat Israel right. And in fact, those that surround President Donald Trump are part of that evangelical uh, committee that empower him and encourage him toward good relationships toward Israel. So they have the backing of the, of the evangelicals who see great merit in being able to support Israel. But not only that, but President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, he also is Jewish. In fact, under this headline uh, by Bess Levin, she says, Jared Kushner, nobody loves a Jew like Donald Trump. And in this article, it goes on to just talk about Jared's uh, ongoing pursuit to help bring about legislation that equals the playing field against anti-Semitism. And she goes on to say many, she believed that this is not so much about anti-Semitism as much as it is, it has to do with supporting and protecting Israel and promoting the agenda of Israel here in the United States. Under this heading, it says, don't talk about history, how Jared Kushner crafted his Middle East peace plan. Jared Kushner is the machine behind this latest Abraham Accord, which has brought together the four different nations that have come into one alliance, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, the United States, and Israel. All four have signed a peace treaty that is rapidly moving toward a cohesive harmony in the Middle East amongst Israel and the Palestinians, as well as, as well as Arabia. But not only that, but listen carefully, of course, since Jared is, is President Trump's son-in-law, then it's only natural, of course, that his, his daughter is married to him and she practices his religion. Now just think about this for just a moment. Not only are the leaders in Israel of the Sanhedrin, Jewish, who observe the Sabbath, President Trump's son-in-law observes the Sabbath, along with his daughter observes the Sabbath, along with those, in, those of the evangelicals who are support of Israel that keeps the Sabbath. And then not only that, but Benjamin Netanyahu had promised in 2014 that one day Israel will be led by Jewish, the Jewish Talmud, which also suggests that he's in support of the Sabbath because he himself is, is Israeli. So notice this, is it possible that the events that culminate the last final events of Earth's history, speaking of the mark of the beast, could it be around a day when those in power, the Jewish people who are in power in every segment of society, we see it in every phase and facet of the development of the new world order, is it possible to believe that this is a circulated around a day? Well, anything's possible, but is it probable? I don't think so. I don't think so. And this is where I want to end our study in our series because we're heading towards some serious times. And as we as a people need to know and understand that we need to have our calling and election sure that we know Jesus and have an ongoing, consistent relationship with him. Because you see, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter, and lo, I stood on the Mount Zion, and, and lo, I looked, 
and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name in their forehead. The people of God in the last days are those, listen carefully, in Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 12, it says, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. But at the name of Jesus, these people, God's people, will have Jesus written on their breast. You know how I know? Because the Bible says that Paul, when speaking about the people of God, for as much as ye have manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, written not with ink, but with the finger of God, not on tables of stone, but in precious tables of the heart. What is God writing there? In Hebrews, the eighth chapter, it says that God is writing his law on the heart. And what is the law a reflection of? The character of Jesus. So watch this now. Those that stand on Mount Zion are those who have the character of Jesus Christ written across their breast and the Father's name written across their forehead. It was Jesus, the one, the conquering king, who came and wore a crown of thorns, who said, my brow was pierced, so yours won't receive the mark of the beast. My hands were printed with nails so that you don't have to receive the mark in your hands. God, Jesus, the one who died on the cross for you and for me, the one who has proclaimed that his goodness is throughout the earth, the one who's looking for that person who will show themselves strong and mighty on his behalf. He said, I've endorsed my name across your heart. I put, I'm putting the Father's name on your forehead. That's the seal of the living God with those who have a relationship with him. Oh, I want to encourage you. In these last days and hours, as we look toward the horizon and the mark of the beast will soon be put forth, that you will be a faithful soldier, that you will be a faithful follower of Jesus to the very end, that the sun of righteousness will shine inside of you, that my people might see the glory of God. May God bless you as we continue to pray one for another and strive toward the kingdom, for the day is soon to come when the beast will impose its power, but God will have a faithful, stay faithful to the end. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your blessing, for your authority, for your power. Please, oh God, continue to help us be a people who are submitted to you and walk in covenant friendship. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.